Institute for International Economics in Washington. We're grateful to a number of Singaporean institutions for their partnership and support, including TAMASEC and including the Monetary Authority of Singapore, who we we're doing a joint session with shortly in honor of their 50th anniversary to Golden Jubilee. The Next Step Conference is the brainchild of our joint institutions to try to get beyond the conferences that are more show than substance and deliberately to get to a place that is about international cooperation, not blindly, but practically. And therefore, we're particularly proud to be basing the conference in Singapore, where it is possible to step back a bit from the giants of the Pacific, even though they must be engaged and look more globally. It's also very exciting for us to be joint and working with Singapore because this is about global forces of technology, of trade, of commerce, of migration, but in particular, the adaptation along all these dimensions of open economies, which Singapore and others so well exemplify. This is not an Asian conference. This is a global conference, but it is to bring people together who are not just people who look like me. Uh, this is to bring together people who are not just people from the G7 capitals, but decision makers and young people from business and from academia, as well as policymaking. In that regard, we've been very generously supported in the sense of time and spirit by the senior minister from Singapore, Tharman Shanmugaratnam, who leads our advisory panel and has worked closely with Danny, me, and our teams to create the conference. A final note before I turn it over to my colleague, Danny Kwa, the Next Step conferences are an annual event. This is our preliminary virtual run. There's nothing preliminary about the substance. This morning, we are including a discussion between Tharman, myself, and Secretary of Commerce from the US, Catherine Raimondo. What is preliminary is, of course, like everything else in this world, it is virtual rather than in person. We hope to move to a hybrid, mostly in-person format for the launch of the first full conference in May of 2022. The Next Step Conference series will then proceed annually from there. Now, let me introduce my good friend, Danny Kwa, who is Lee Cushing, Professor of Economics and Dean at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Kwa's research is primarily in two areas, inequality and income mobility, and second, supply and demand of world order. It is this juxtaposition of moral and practical that made it such an attractive thing for me and the Peterson Institute to partner with Danny. Danny, of course, is one of the world's leading macroeconometricians. His previous research work concerned technical matters and economic growth and econometrics, including a few groundbreaking studies. He was previously professor in economics and international development at the London School of Economics. Danny, over to you, please. Thank you, Adam, for that very kind introduction. And welcome again, everyone, to this Peterson Institute Lee Kuan Yew School Next Step Global Conference. What's this about? It is beyond dispute that the, you know, the arc of our global economy has seen severe disruption since at least the 2000s trajectory of hyperglobalization. There was a time when it seemed unstoppable how increasing ease with which anything anyone made or thought anywhere on the planet was becoming available to ever more of us everywhere. This trajectory has been brought up short by first emerging political frictions, internal in many nations, building on what at first seemed to be just small local challenges in identity politics, community dissatisfaction, but then flaring up geopolitically across our planet. And then following that, actual disruption from many orthogonal directions, global pandemic, explicit policy interruption, technological conflict. The world's economic landscape that we navigate today is more tentative and conditional and contingent than it has been for many decades. It's with this, this backdrop that our two institutions, the Peter Institution, Peter, Peterson Institute in Washington, DC, the Lee Kuan Yew School in Singapore, 
has come together to work on ways forwards from today's point of tentative contingency in the global economy. We think the well-being of humanity depends on all of us taking wiser steps from here on out. And our two institutions are united in two principal ideas, although here I'm mentioning just two, heading up many other points of agreement between us. The first, that hard-headed, rigorous thinking driven by empirical evidence, scientific thinking is essential for carving out the right pathways ahead. And second, that global inclusiveness in the conversation is key. We need in this conversation that we're building, that we're embarking on, to engage from around the planet as many concerned, thoughtful, and informed voices as possible. So this Next Step Global Conference, organized by Peterson Institute, by the Lee Kuan Yew School, can be only the first of a series that we're going to be building through the coming years. I now want to turn to bringing in Singapore Senior Minister Taman Shanmugaratnam, who among many, many other roles as a leading global statesperson, has been, for Adam and me, a driving force and a voice of good sense throughout our organization of this conference. Senior Minister Taman, over to you, please. Thanks very much, uh, Adam and Danny. Uh, thanks for having me join you at this uh, uh, opening session, this brief opening session to the Next Step uh, uh, Global Conference. And indeed, uh, the, at this initiation of a series of uh, annual conferences that you're going to, going to host. Uh, it's a very unusual time. It's a very unusual phase for all of us, wherever we are globally. And it is a more challenging and uh, complex time for policymaking uh, and for politics uh, than has been the case in decades. It's a very unusual time. Danny spoke about uh, the disrupted uh, arc of history. Um, we don't even know what the trajectories will be. Uh, I don't think we have seen such a wide cone of possibilities, such a wide range of possible trajectories um, that we now see, at least not since the time when China began liberalizing its economy in the late 70s or since the fall of the Berlin Wall. We are back in a world of fundamental uncertainty. Uh, and the range of trajectories that one can meaningfully and rationally expect uh, is now very wide. And it requires, as uh, Danny was just saying, uh, inclusiveness in debate and thinking and inclusiveness in the way we shape strategies to serve the interests of a very broad majority of people. It requires global thinking, not just national, and it requires not just hard-headed economic thinking, but new political strategies. So it's more complex than we've, more complex and of a scale that's much larger than we've seen in decades. Not just for economic policy making, but for politics everywhere. And part of that complexity comes out of the fact that we're dealing at once with macroeconomic challenges, short to medium term, structural challenges, which will be with us for a while. And we are facing the challenges of the existential commons, 
climate security, and pandemic security. And they come together, not just over the long term, they are with us today. And we have to work out transitions to address the structural challenges and the existential commons in a way that doesn't upset the macroeconomic cut and in a way that's sustainable economically and financially. And we've never had a challenge of such complexity and scale, certainly not in decades. In the short term, macroeconomics is back or the traditional macroeconomic trade-offs between growth and inflation uh, are back. A case can be made to say that inflation is transitionary. The pickup in inflation is transitional because we know that there are supply side dislocations which should hopefully eventually uh, be uh, ameliorated and eliminated. But a case can also be made for inflation becoming more broad, broad based and inflationary pressures to be, to be back in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. And the contest is not just with whose economic thinking or whose model is superior to the other, but it's now about accepting that there is a wide range of what could happen. Things are uncertain. And central banks really have to build that uncertainty into policy making and not leave things too late. That's the short term. Macroeconomic trade offs are back. The structural challenges are predate the COVID 19, but they are accelerating. Today's labor force shortages in many economies, particularly the most advanced economies, certainly the United States, shouldn't obscure the more fundamental challenge coming, which is that the march of automation has picked up pace. Partly because of COVID-19, partly because of the labor shortages, but it's picking up space and there are many miles to go in automation. And they will face they will pose fundamental challenges, economic, social, political, if we don't respond proactively with some force and inclusively. And we should never forget the larger structural challenge, which is that of the potential divergence between the advanced and developing world. And we are back in a world of possible divergences after two to three decades of gradual convergence. There is a very real risk of a rollback in the progress that we've seen in education, in economic development broadly, and in optimism. There's a very real risk of, of, of a rollback. And that's, that is the largest structural challenge we face. The global inequities, which already opened up in a very sharp way during COVID-19, particularly vaccination, vaccine inequities, but it's possibly a, a problem of a much more lasting character, which will not just be an economic problem. And then we have the challenge of the existential commons, most complex, a new public policy challenge and a new political challenge everywhere in the world. And by any reckoning, both public policy and private economic activity will have to step up the pace of adjustment in order to avoid disaster further down the road. And there are no simplicities. It will have to involve carbon pricing. It's not just the economists who, who know that, it's now becoming mainstream understanding. It will have to involve regulation, not just pricing, but it will also have to involve substantially greater investment by reasonable estimates, something like 150 trillion over the next three decades. Investment in 
renewable energies, investment in region, upgrading whole electricity grids, investment in clean cement and steel or alternatives to steel, investment in new agricultural technologies. It all requires investment. And the scale of investment is such that unless you move immediately today to vastly higher carbon pricing, which will be disruptive, private markets will be slow to adjust. It requires public-private collaboration. It requires the public sector to get into a whole new game of de-risking of investments to spur and catalyze private investment. And we are past the old debates, the old debates of over the potential and the failures of dirigist policies, but we now have to enter a whole new arena of public-private collaboration, whether we like it or not, regardless of our ideological priors, we have to get into a whole new game of public-private collaboration to be able to catalyze the massive investments required. And we need new ways of financing it, new revenue streams, on the part of the public sector, but critically, rejigging financial markets so as to incentivize and encourage the redirection of private investment into transition. So when you put it all together, the shorter macroeconomic challenges, the stubborn structural issues that are now becoming more serious, particularly in the labor market and particularly with regard to global inequities and the existential commons. It requires that mix of hard-headed economic thinking, political strategy and forthrightness about the challenges and inclusiveness. Because without inclusiveness, nothing is going to be sustained politically whether it's carbon pricing, regulation, or any of our other, other major adjustments. So these are the next steps that we will have to discuss, not just at this year's inaugural conference, but in coming years. It requires a global approach, as Adam and Danny were saying, not just Asian, not just American, it requires global thinking. And I once again commend you and your two fine solution-oriented think tanks for taking the lead on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senior Minister. We will now go into our first session. I will just wait a second while my panelists come up on screen. And I will now welcome everyone to this first session of our inaugural Peterson Institute Lee Kuan Yew School Next Step Global Conference. Um, I have some other panelists who have not yet uh, started video. So I might wait a second while they come on in. Jacqueline's here, Mr. Tsai, thank you all very much. So again, welcome everyone to this first session. This is a panel on supply chains in a world of conflict and global pandemic. It is one in a whole sequence of topics that Senior Minister Taman uh, described as an array of issues we need to put hard-headed thinking to, careful and prickle evidence and analysis. We are fortunate to have here for this session among the world's foremost experts in research and practice on these issues. 
what's going to happen from here on out is I'm going to say a few words about the general topic, and then I'm going to hand over to each panelist in turn. All of us, all the panelists will make an opening statement about 10 minutes each before we come back to a short conversation among all of the speakers together. Following that, in the last 25, 30 minutes of this session, I will aim to bring into our discussion questions raised by the audience. So to begin, 200 years ago, yes, I'm gonna take 200 years to go over my short introduction now. 200 years ago, the world economy, for our purposes, was a very straightforward landscape. What the world economy was, was major nations trading corn and textiles, trading things made in one place for things grown in another one place. But fast forward today, among the most consequential of innovations in the global economy is how wrong that picture has become. Because you see, today, very little of anything is made in just one place. Most of what gets shipped across nations is so-called intermediate inputs, things that have value, not because they are directly eaten or used by people, but because they are used to make yet something else. This supply chain is one of the most critical features of the modern global economy, where today, tradables are driven to ever finer micro detail of scheduling, shipping, slotting into place before they are transported to the next step of value adding. Because of this emergence of this global production structure, this world supply chain, disruption of the deep interconnectedness in our global economy has impact that is multiplied and amplified several fold from when one nation might have been interrupted in its economic engagement with another nation. It's not just one thing, textiles or cotton, that a nation has to secure and resource because of disruption. It's now everything. So today's world of global supply chains, resilience and robustness are keywords. On top of that, we have the shadow and light of added interruption, policy challenges over distributional consequences in every nation, concerns over social cohesion is worldwide disruption, national governments unable to focus on greater international integration because they're distracted by domestic concerns on identity politics, on jobs, on inequality, national self-interest magnified into populism and nationalism. We have a whole range of political economy concerns overshadowing the previous imperative on globalization. And to add to all of that, the global economy caught COVID, a pandemic, the scale of which hasn't been seen in a hundred years. So today, the world sits on the verge of two large imperatives in terms of how it integrates with everyone else. There's an imperative for international cooperation on the global pandemic. And there's an imperative in self-interested separation. Supply chains disrupted in a world of COVID and conflict. Now, as I turn to the, our panel now, I want us to be thinking about the important facts on the ground in terms of supply chain disruption. But then as our conversation unfolds, I will try and get our panel to also bring out what they see the important challenges are to be addressed individually in each of our nations or jointly across them. So to begin, let me turn to the panel in order. I'm not gonna be reading people's uh, bios. You all already have that on websites and, and other things. Didi Basri formerly Indonesia's finance minister, today, among other things, economics professor at the University of Indonesia. We're keen to hear your views on this globalization, global supply chains generally, but I know that you also have special insight on the political economy challenges in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia. 
you thought hard about what alternative supply chain suppliers means, when in a sense, all suppliers can be in the same situation of disrupted or inadequate provision. Great to hear your views here, Didi. Over to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Annie. Good evening or uh, good morning uh, for the uh, participant. Allow me to use my slides here, but I don't worry, I will limit myself maximum for uh, 10 minutes for my uh, presentation. I, I would like to uh, share with you the perspective of Indonesia and Southeast Asia regarding the supply chains in the world conflict and COVID. Yeah, why Indonesia is a rather unique. Indonesia is a country with 270 million population. We have a huge domestic market. So some people argue that our dependence to the global economy perhaps will be relatively less compared to country like Singapore or maybe Vietnam or Malaysia. Yeah, but I will argue the other way around. So let me start by putting the context first here. Yeah? As Danny said that the pandemic uh, have exposed many vulnerabilities in supply chains and raised doubt about globalization. And actually, even before the pandemic, um, there were some pushback about the globalization, but several issues that we learned from this uh, pandemic, um, uh, the dependence for other countries somehow create also uh, political economy problems. Yeah, for example, let me give an example about the vaccine nationalism. Yeah, the shortage of medical supplies, temporary trade bans, which is somehow trigger um, the policy maker to rethinking about uh, again, uh, whether is it wise to integrate, fully integrated with the global economy or not. And this is the chart that I, uh, me and my colleague uh, uh, Raharja uh, uh, look at for the, some countries in Asia. This is based on the global financial crisis back on 2008. It is very interesting that uh, Asia is country that maintain or even increase their share on domestic demand were relatively in a better position with stand and global economic downturn. You know, somehow, this is an argument saying that we probably doesn't really need to integrate the, you know, our economy to the global economy. But let me uh, take you to the case of Indonesia. Yeah, this is just, I'll be very brief on this. A correlation between investment and import is very strong because 90% of our import is made up of capital goods and raw materials. As a developing country, we need to import capital. So integration of the economy, like the supply chains, is a very key important ingredient for us to grow. Yeah. So if we try to sort of like you know to shift uh, focus only on domestic economy, then there will be an implication. It's going to affect our investment. And even I was talking about this private consumption. When we try to look at the co-movement between the private consumption, our private consumption was mainly driven by the exports, yeah, the lack effect of export. So uh, one thing that I was trying to say from this is even uh, Indonesian economy, whose domestic market is relatively large, we cannot afford to avoid the global economic integration, let alone other Asian countries whose domestic market are much smaller than us. Yeah, so the issue is uh, we still need supply chain integration, the production network. But exactly like uh, uh, Minister Tarman mentioned in his remarks and also Danny mentioned, uh, this pandemic, this uh, geopolitical conflict somehow created sort of like uh, resistance towards globalization. Yeah, some politician, including in my country, started to talk about the risk of interdependence, especially when the issue of this vaccine nationalism yeah, race. Um, Danny, perhaps you remember in the, the early day of COVID, about a year ago, we sit together with other uh, Asian economists. We try a uh, call for the policymaker 
to continue for the cooperation and integration. Yeah, because we are worried about this. Is everyone just focusing on their national interest? What is happening in the case of vaccine is a very good example of this prisoner's dilemma. Because everyone is focusing on their own self-interest, we cannot we cannot solve this global problem. Yeah, because we need to cooperate. And then at the same time, we do have some problems about these political economy factors because, as I said, you know, every country tries to secure their own interests. They don't want to be dependent to other country. Yeah. And when the economy is slowed down, the easiest way to put the blame is identity politics. And this is not unique for Indonesia, also in many countries in Asia, in Europe, even in the US. Yeah, but one thing that I would like to, we can discuss about it later on. This is not only about the national interest identity politics, but also about the issue of the rent seeking, because the interest group would like to protect their business as well. Yeah, from the competition. Yeah, so this is a sort of like mix of various factors. So I would imagine that the political pressure yeah, will continue to increase the domestic production employment home countries and then uh, reduce or even eliminate the dependence on source that perceive risky. This will be the, the, the context. That is why we can see the pushback on the globalization. Unfortunately, Danny, and this, uh, in this uh, current global uh, situation now, it's very difficult to expect there will be a unilateral reform because politicians will say, why should I open our economy? if other country doesn't want to open their economies. Yeah, at the same time, we see um, the multilateral prospect is not clear as well. So perhaps we are not talking about the first best world, but probably one of the possible solution for this is regional cooperation. Yeah, we keep the regional cooperation, but we can only talk about regional cooperation provided that every members could feel the benefit of it. Yeah. This is the, the, the pushback of globalization, but on the other hand, we realize that consumers continue wants to low price and then a country like Indonesia and some countries in ASEAN, domestic capacities are limited. Yeah, we cannot pass through the impact of this inefficiency. Yeah, um, the pandemic also affect the domestic sectors. So even we try to renationalize, it won't help because the domestic sectors also affect them. So uh, this is very interesting, yeah, if you look at ASEAN. While the political histories and institutional capabilities of ASEAN 5, yeah, vary greatly, but we do have a history of increasing regional and global economic integration. So this is, this is the first point. The second one is most of the factors behind the discontent with globalization in the rich economy are not present in the same degree here in ASEAN. And the reason behind it is, because we are benefited by the globalization. If you look at the story, the success, the history of the success of the East Asian economies, the ASEAN economies, is basically trade, industrialization, and integration to the global economy, right? So, but I have to say that no grounds for complacency because economic growth is slowing down, some issue of the identity politics, etc. So the question is, how do we manage this? How do we strike the balance between those two? The way I look at the situation is maintaining the domestic demand is a very important. Yeah. Uh, however, as I said, that given the importance of trade to economic growth, there is no way that we can afford to avoid the global integration. But the question is how? So the first answer, we can have a more discussion on this. Diversification is a key word. The diversification of the supply chain base, the diversification of the export and country's destination. Yeah, even country like Indonesia, we have to diversify our export product, not only rely on natural resources, but more on the manufacturing services, etc. And then the second one is the role of this digital and technology. Yeah, I would imagine that you know automation somehow will help. Because if pandemic happen, you know, somehow is this uh, uh, global supply chain happens through the automation, the process probably will be relatively easier to be handled. And I would imagine like the technology 3D printings. Yeah, if we have the 3D printing somehow, this would reduce 
the risk of these disruptions as well. And the AI perhaps can help us to make a predictive decisions. So the role of technology is a very important thing. What are the opportunities? I can see one of the lessons learned from this pandemic is don't put all your eggs in one basket. So we will see the relocation of the investment to many Southeast Asian economies, including in Indonesia, provided we are able to provide the good climate, infrastructure, etc. The other thing is perhaps the just-in-time manufacturing concept may be over, called intermediate infantry to save system. So we have to strike the balance this. And the partnership with the supply chains makes a difference. So based on that, what ASEAN country can do to sort of like to make this all this idea operable. We have to start on something which is politically feasible, but have a higher marginal impact for the future reform. So this is will be my last slide, Danny. We have to try to find an identification about activities that have a high impact to the people, but also have this common interest. And I can see cooperation, collaboration on health digital transformation this is as an example that perhaps can be a high priority once people feel the benefit of it we could maintain the continuation of the global supply chains and this will incentivize leaders politicians to continue to work to make sure that the global integration is there i stop it here thank you very much Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Didi, for bringing in so clearly the political economy challenge. You've described threats to multilateralism, how nations think of themselves rightly or wrongly as being trapped in a game situation that doesn't allow them to be more collaborative. Although I'm relieved to hear that, you know, ASEAN, in your view, is, is an interesting counterexample, and we continue to hope that. Uh, diversification will help, but you're also cautious and realistic on how far we can go with that. The phrase striking the right balance runs through your thinking, and I'm sure we're going to come back to a lot more of this. Let me turn, if I may, to the second panelist, Chad Bone, Regional, uh, Reginald Jones Senior Fellow at Peterson Institute, but of course, also previously economists, lead economists, senior economists across a range of important uh, policymaking institutions. Chad, you have had extremely high visibility recently across policy making in the world with your views and research on global supply chains generally, but also in particular on supply chains in our world's most critical products today, semiconductors, vaccines, protective equipment. Semiconductors, of course, the quintessential and ubiquitous intermediate input. So turning to you, what specific dynamics do you see in these products in their supply chains and possibly what general lessons can we take from what's happening in these markets? Chad, over to you, please. Thanks, Danny, for the, the kind introduction. Um, it is wonderful to be with you all today. So indeed, I'm going to um, talk about what I thought would be useful to help kind of set the stage for this session, which is what's going on right now uh, in terms of policy, at least, for those three critical supply chains that you mentioned, uh, semiconductors, the vaccines that have turned out to be so important during the pandemic, uh, and as well, the experiences of personal protective equipment um, for healthcare workers and, and such. So let me start with semiconductors. Um, and as we'll hear more from our experts in a moment, uh, everyone knows now these are the ubiquitous chips that are used in inputs for most everything. Um, they are, their supply chains are under scrutiny today, and that's primarily because with the pandemic, depend, demand and, and um, has shifted and spiked. And what it has meant is with too few of these chips, the automotive sector, but not just autos, others as well, have been forced to cut production. That's put pressure on their workforces that are already struggling with the pandemic and the recovery. But semiconductor supply chains were under stress well before the pandemic. Beginning in 2018, the US administration imposed 25% tariffs under Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974. This was part of the trade war with China. And imports of chips from China fell by billions per year. The administration then imposed unilateral and extraterritorial export controls on semiconductors, as well as the semiconductor manufacturing equipment to certain Chinese firms for national security and related reasons. This triggered hoarding 
and other market disruptions. And those policies mostly remain unchanged today. At the moment, the US Congress is considering legislation. Uh, this is called the CHIPS Act. And it could result in tens of billions of dollars of subsidies to the industry. Europe has suggested a European CHIPS Act could also be in the offing. Japan, other countries as well, have suggested new subsidies. In the US legislation, the exact funding is not yet settled. Some subsidies may be one-off incentives to locate or expand production facilities in the United States, potentially even offered on a non-discriminatory basis to both American and foreign headquartered firms. Some of the funding would be for research and development. But some of the, the subsidies may be tied to production of what are called legacy or the, the older node chips that are critical for sectors like automobiles. And some of those subsidies may be needed in perpetuity if those semiconductors cannot be manufactured profitably in the United States or in another trusted supplier country and politicians decide they are so important that these new supply chains need to be established. CHIPS Act types of legislation could be an unprecedented foray into industrial policy for the United States. Obviously that raises a number of concerns. One of which is the difference between the speed at which this particular industry operates and its technology evolves, which is incredibly fast, and the speed at which governments change policy, which is incredibly slow. Policymakers also lack access to the detailed data on what is produced, where and by whom, as well as the real-time demand information revealing which automotive, medical device, consumer electronics, or other company is running short on chips at any moment in time. To reduce the chance of policy failure here, the United States and other trusted supplier countries should cooperate on a semiconductor supply chain resilience policy. That means coordinating on things like export controls, so the United States isn't just imposing them unilaterally, as well as on any subsidies to highlight research and development and to ensure diversification across nodes, the types of chips being produced, as well as suppliers and locations. However, I do worry about the United States suddenly giving up on the fight against other countries' semiconductor subsidies. Even though they have made progress with the European Union, for example, through this thing called the brand new Trade and Technology Council, both the US and Europe are naive to think that places elsewhere around the world, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, and of course China, won't just simply respond with more and more subsidies of their own. A result could therefore be global overcapacity, new problems, allegations of dumping, tariffs, and potentially market segmentation down the road. My second example is of COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing supply chains, as this has become a second important uh, area for US policy. Now, to start, of course, the speed of scientific advancement in the emergence of manufacturing supply chains for vaccines from Pfizer and BioNTech, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca in the United States, in Europe especially, uh, as well as India, and some other places around the world, this has been extraordinary. Policy played a sizable role, but it also could have done better. The United States, for example, used Operation Warp Speed and the Defense Production Act to expedite the vaccine development and manufacturing process. Washington allocated more funding to scale up manufacturing at risk and over the entire vaccine manufacturing supply chain, including critical raw materials and equipment. A really, really important question is why other countries didn't. Why didn't other countries also subsidize input expansion in particular? Yet, despite the US subsidies, those key inputs have been in scarce supply, both within the United States and globally. Now, the US used the Defense Production Act to give policymakers some visibility into those supply chains to help those scarce inputs be allocated and prioritized to plants manufacturing the priority vaccines. Those policymaker decisions have necessarily been imperfect, given shifting conditions brought on by the pandemic. Some supplies have been given to vaccine manufacturers that regulators have not accepted. Look at the CureVac example. But leaving such input allocations purely to markets would likely have resulted in other supply chain problems. However, the allegations that the United States banned exports of inputs, even though subsequently refuted by the data, does identify the need for additional transparency, information sharing, and cooperation with key partners. 
Though the United States and Europe, for example, have been cooperating informally since March of 2021 to resolve vaccine supply chain bottlenecks, their joint task force was only formalized this past September. Furthermore, that positive effort should be expanded. In the case of vaccines, it should be extended to other critical countries in the supply chain, including India, perhaps through the Quad initiative, and lessons learned there should be shared with other supply chain resilience policy initiatives, such as what we're seeing with semiconductors. Nevertheless, nevertheless it is certainly true the US, EU, UK, and India all engaged in what we've already heard about, vaccine nationalism, as was expected. Each failed to export enough final finished doses of vaccines quickly enough to build on and support COVAX and to follow global public health objectives by prioritizing healthcare workers and the most vulnerable populations globally to reduce the likelihood of the emergence of variants. The third supply chain I wanna talk about briefly is personal protective equipment. The United States, Europe, and many others around the world experienced PPE shortages early in the pandemic. Many countries, including the United States, imposed export controls. Furthermore, the United States also eventually allocated over a billion dollars of subsidies to expand capacity across its domestic PPE supply chain, not just for products like surgical masks and gloves, but also the critical inputs like the fibers, the rubbers, and the filters needed to manufacture them. A domestic PPE industry in the United States has now emerged. Many companies that did not receive government support also responded to price signals by entering the market. However, as the pandemic recedes and prices fall, much of the U.S. industry may find it difficult to compete with lower cost imports, primarily located in China. Yet the early days of the pandemic revealed that an excessive global concentration of resi residual supply for the PPE was coming out of China. Now, China's export expansion beginning in April 2020 did eventually save many millions of lives globally. But unfortunately, its export shortfall during the pandemic's early days likely cost lives. Thus, cooperating over PPE supply chains will need to provide the United States and other key partners with the opportunity to encourage diversification, as well as potentially improving domestic policies on things like procurement, inventory management, stockpiling, and regulatory policy. Finally, to, to conclude, the experiences of semiconductors, COVID-19 vaccines, and PPE all argue strongly against, strongly against purely domestic supply chains and autarky. Trade in these sectors has been critical throughout the pandemic. No one has been spared the need to lock down at some point. Policymakers must therefore resist calls for excessive concentration of production domestically, which could create even more vulnerabilities. Supply chain resilience thus means additional transparency, inventory management, and diversified sourcing with trusted partners, as well as new commitments to quickly engage and cooperate on policy when an emergency strikes, especially to expand production. We have not seen that in this pandemic. From here in Washington, let me conclude by saying U.S. supply chain resilience policy is still a work in progress, but there are some signs of potential cooperation. The U.S.-EU partnership is perhaps the most advanced to date, though there's still a lot of work there to go to ensure that we do it better in the future. Thank you for letting me be a part of this, this session today. Thank you, Chad. On semiconductor chips, we're of course gonna come back and hear more from MediaTek's Mr. Tsai in just a while. But Chad, your stories are fascinating. Policies on these intricately intertwined supply chains cannot be isolated and must not be overly concentrated. Our early experiences in responding overly hastily to these have led to just a plethora of patches that we've tried to put one on top of another. And the stories are all different. It is not a solution to think about supply chains being relocated to simply a domestic geography. Really interesting ideas that we're gonna come back to over and over, I'm sure. If I may, let me turn now to Michael Buchanan comes to us from Temasek, where he's head of portfolio strategy and risk group, among many other things. Mike, at, at, Singapore's, at, at Temasek, Singapore's Temasek, you lead on these very important issues, mac macro strategy, portfolio strategy, risk. So you have a front row seat on the challenges and opportunities in these large micro and macro trends. You also look at very specific firms and businesses 
opportunities and challenges on these changes in your view? Over to you, please. Great. Well, thanks, Danny. And yes, certainly an interesting uh, seat to, uh, to watch all this unfold. Uh, but first, thanks to uh, the Peterson Institute and the LKY School for inviting me on to uh, you know, what is such an interesting panel. Uh, I thought I would uh, try and divide my initial remarks roughly into three parts. So the specifics of the supply chain issues uh, that we're witnessing, the uh, policy implications that stem from that, uh, especially for, for central banks, and then uh, the sort of broader, longer-term issues that all policymakers will need to focus on, including how geopolitical tensions and uh, perhaps, if there's time, climate risks uh, feed into these issues. So first, let me acknowledge that in general, I'd say the, the COVID-led supply chain disruptions have been even more persistent and broader than we expected last year. And there are three key bottlenecks that require resolving. So transport logistics, semiconductors, as we've uh, just heard uh, very eloquently, uh, and the supply of labor. Now, none of these will be solved uh, immediately, um, but to us, it's, um, it's probably the labor market really that will cause the uh, more lasting issues. As a result, uh, those disruptions are now posing significant challenges to policymakers. And one important implication has been on inflation and monetary policy. So for example, uh, and I'll come back to this in a moment, uh, and perhaps if the slides can be sort of brought up, uh, I'll refer to those in just a moment. But the uh, supply demand imbalances have created a uh, sizable uh, upward pressure on core PCE inflation in the US. And we expect that to persist uh, through probably to the middle of next year. We'll then get a little bit of a relaxation before then the structural drivers uh, take over and require the policy response. Looking beyond those immediate issues, the supply chain vulnerabilities that have been uh, exposed by COVID uh, are accelerating longer term trends. So uh, greater diversification of operations, a need for sort of a, a second choice, whether it's a port or a producer, and a further shift uh, to nearshoring. So pre-COVID and even uh, prior to the intensification of geopolitical tensions uh, before COVID itself, there was uh, already uh, momentum here. Um, and now, um, as we look ahead, greater climate change mitigation efforts uh, around the world, including over the weekend, uh, create further incentives for this, uh, with some wrinkles perhaps around carbon border taxes uh, that could come down the road. So with that, uh, let me start with a few key points on the uh, disruptions that we've been seeing. Uh, so Jessica, okay, you've got page two up, that's great. So as I mentioned earlier, we see um, three main choke points with regards to the supply chain issues in the US, port congestion, availability of uh, semiconductor chips and labor supply. So uh, let's start with ports. Congestion of ports remains at record high. So for example, on the, uh, on the left here, you can see in the blue lines that about a third of all containers in, in Long Beach are now delayed by more than five days, up from below 5% pre-COVID. Then in the black line, you can see that we have 77 ships waiting at anchor. Now, um, you know, for those of us who sail in, uh, in Singapore, that doesn't sound very much, but it's up from basically none pre-COVID. And associated with that, you can see the huge spike in freight rates on the right. So the green line shows uh, the rise in air freight rates, uh, which have tripled since the, uh, the 2019 average, while the black line shows the rise in uh, freight rates by sea, which are up an even more staggering 12 times on the Shanghai to North America. Now, the bad news is that, uh, you know, we don't really see any immediate fixes for the underlying supply demand imbalances of ports. It could even get a touch worse before it improves next year. I mean, ports are still constrained by their uh, capacity to handle containers after they're unloaded, labor shortages, uh, warehousing space, uh, even just a lack of enough equipment to being cited as the main obstacles uh, that we hear uh, to accelerating uh, more containers. And so, you know, even though yes, you're seeing a move to 24 seven operational hours for ports and may not help that much for a while. So if we assume no more surprises, so, you know, no more major port lockdowns in China, then uh, it's probably the case that we'll only start to see a more uh, significant easing after Chinese New Year uh, in February next year, uh, because during that period, uh, you know, the port of LA typically sees a, a decline of about 25%. Uh, so that'll allow them to kind of clear up some backlogs, but really you're looking right into, um, uh, you know, mid to, to late 2022 to, to clear all of this. Now, sure, uh, you know, some of the things that we hear uh, from those involved, um, there might be some, they might want to call sort of front loading or double ordering. Uh, you know, when you have these constraints, people might 
want to sort of order a little bit more a little bit earlier. Um, no real hard evidence on that. I mean, no one's going to really announce it. Uh, but if that is true, uh, that could add a little bit of strain up front, but then provide more of a breather uh, after the, the Chinese New Year holidays. Um, so again, that sort of adds to, a, you know, nothing's going to improve until we get right into next year. Uh, so Jessica, if you can click to page three, please. You can see that uh, semiconductor shortages have also been uh, a major uh, stumbling block. We're now over a year into the deepest uh, chip shortage in decades. Sales volumes down, you know, sort of 20% below trend at the trough. Lead times 40% above normal levels. Uh, a little bit like, you know, what, what you know, we've just heard, but this is against, you know, strong secular demand uh, after COVID, uh, 5G rollout, um, cloud computing, uh, switch to electric vehicles, strong, you know, PC smartphone, gaming upgrade, given everyone's uh, in lockdown. And it may not be until the second half of next year again that we see those uh, supply demand uh, imbalances uh, return to, to normal. There'll probably be some variation uh, within the industry. Um, so sort of funnily enough, this time it's sort of the, the basic chips where it could be even slower to see a resumption of normality because of a lack of investment in recent years, uh, plus a significant increase in demand for uh, the applications for those chips. Uh, I think, you know, sort of uh, IoT and, and autos. So, you know, no matter where you look, and you can see that, uh, you know, in uh, the, uh, the, the chart here, uh, you know, you're seeing um, uh, inventories incredibly low, uh, green for Taiwan in the top left, Korea uh, in blue on the bottom left, the lead time for chips three to four times longer uh, than, uh, than average, uh, you know, in some areas, 34 weeks rather than eight to 12 weeks. The largest bottlenecks currently in, in this part of the world, Southeast Asia, uh, partly because of some um, choking in, in supply chains in Malaysia. Uh, and so um, it could really take some time, as I say, before all of this uh, is reduced. So what's sort of been happening in the industry? Uh, there has been quite a lot of announcement of, of new investment, TSMC uh, investing over 100 billion over the next three years to increase capacity. That could even be increased. Uh, Intel has broken ground on construction of uh, a couple of new fabs in Arizona. Uh, they're meant to be ready in um, uh, 2024. Uh, they're also looking at adding more facilities elsewhere in the US and Europe. Global Foundries, of course, investing $4 billion in Singapore, $1 billion in New York, um, more in Germany. Uh, the Singapore facility should come online in, in 2023. So there's a lot going on. But, you know, semiconductor manufacturing is, is probably one area where geopolitics uh, will have a very important uh, role uh, to play. Um, many governments, of course, have been encouraging strategic onshoring and chip production. Uh, that will, um, you know, that cause maybe a, a broader geographical footprint for production, less reliance on Taiwan, but less, um, less effi uh, efficiency. So the US, um, EU, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, China, they're all uh, setting aside money that adds up to over a trillion dollars to support local chip production. And you know, even in this space, which obviously has a lot of economies of scale, that's some pretty serious money, could create some distortions. But I guess the bottom line to us is, you know, TSMC, Intel, Samsung, you know, they've got first mover advantages. They've created the IP and scale and the kind of broader ecosystem economies of scope barriers uh, that will help um, their, their countries. So our best guess is in the long term, you know, Taiwan, TSMC, um, you know, will continue to dominate advanced chip production. But I think, you know, Arizona and the US could become, you know, quite a credible ecosystem uh, also for advanced chip production. Uh, finally, labor supply. Uh, so Jessica, if you can click to page four, please. Um, the difficulty in getting qualified labor uh, remains a key bottleneck for firms, particularly in real estate and industrial companies. And so, so far we've seen the largest wage increases for those in the lowest paying sectors and people staying out of the labor market due to childcare needs, the direct risk of getting COVID uh, in particular. Um, and so going forward, uh, you know, th these sort of COVID specific reasons for lower labor force participation should fade uh, along with the expiry of some of the expanded unemployment benefits um, and as schools reopen and as hopefully the healthcare concerns are uh, diminished through vaccinations, we would expect those labor supply constraints to ease, um, but not fully. Um, 
there will be you know, some early retirement, some reduction in participation uh, more permanently. Um, so far, though, what you know hasn't really played out in terms of people coming back into the labour force, but we do expect that to have a more meaningful uh, impact going forward. Now, that said, I think it's important to remember we've had a much larger uh, fiscal and monetary stimulus this time around than, for example, during the GFC or uh, any other uh, shock, really, uh, even when you put it against the size of the initial macro shock. And so we're more likely to see meaningful tightness in the labour market uh, in the years ahead. Now, just uh, briefly, um, just if you go to slide five, let me just sort of bring this back to what it means for policymakers, at least, you know, monetary uh, and macro policymakers. Um, you know, obviously a key channel of impact of all of this is via inflation and, and therefore monetary policy. So uh, on the right, you can see that durable goods, which is the uh, dark blue line at the top, that has dominated the rise in inflation so far, but services is now starting to move and we expect that to continue. And on the left, you can see the starkest increase in prices owing to the supply demand imbalances, particularly in new and used cars, apparel, household appliances, recreational goods. So overall, we estimate that at the, the peak back in May, uh, the supply constrained categories added uh, at least 140 basis points to core PCE inflation. So with the supply chain issues expected to resolve themselves only around the middle of next year, as, as I was just saying earlier, um, alongside the consumer demand substitution back into services, uh, we expect prices in the supply constrained categories to remain elevated to the middle of next year and then go into actually being a drag on inflation. Um, and most of the temporary price increases should at least partially revert to their pre-pandemic trends. Um, then together with a probably a smaller than average contribution from medical services, given that prices there are being boosted by uh, COVID legislative factors that will expire at the end of the year, uh, we would expect core uh, PCE inflation um, to fall and perhaps even briefly come in below the Feb's 2% two, 2 target in the second half of next year. Um, then uh, we would expect things that, that there's some more structural drivers of inflation, including uh, housing costs and as equivalent rent and so on, to accelerate. Uh, and the tightness in the labour market uh, would continue. And then that would drive inflation back above target and require a monetary policy response. Our base case is the first hike from the Fed would come in 2023, but the risks are for uh, an earlier takeoff. Um, now, I think um, yeah, I've touched a little bit on the geopolitical uh, tensions. I think there's a lot more to say on that, but perhaps uh, we can cover that a little bit more uh, in subsequent sessions. So with that, uh, Danny, let me hand it back to, to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Michael. Indeed, we will come back to these geopolitical issues. I'm very glad that you've, you've highlighted how it is so central in our in the, the narrative we have today of semiconductor manufacturing. It is so critical. Uh, one of the, I mean, among the very, very many interesting facts you've given us is something that for me was quite unexpected because what we've got now in this, in this emerging situation is actually tightness in the labor market and most rapid growth in sectors that are lowest paid. So we've got an added bonus, as it were, in this unexpected reduction in inequality and rerouting supply chains for these reasons might have uh, uh, yet other implications for public policy thinking. Really interesting what you've brought out for us. Thank you very much. I want to turn now to Jacqueline Poe. Jacqueline, you are Managing Director at Singapore's Economic Development Board. In Singapore, as you know, we refer to this fondly as just EDB. And you have also held key positions in Singapore's public service across many, many different domains, technology, labor markets, finance, defense. For the EDB, you are spearheading strategies on Singapore's global hub position in international flows of trade, investments, research, talent. So you are right at the heart of the kind of thinking on where Singapore sits in the global value chain. So I'm curious, as we listen to this discussion about geopolitics, semiconductor manufacturing, and the large changes happening in, in the US and Europe and elsewhere, how do you reckon Singapore's position of centrality as global hub will evolve and adapt as global supply chains reroute and rewire? Over to you, please, Jacqueline. 
Thank you very much, Danny, and thank you to Adam. I'm very proud and uh, pleased to be part of such a distinguished panel. Um, and thank you for asking me for my views as a point of view of a sort of more of a practitioner and policy point of view. Um, I believe that if the world wants to be more popular, more prosperous, more inclusive, and to deliver a better quality of life for all its people, uh, three things need to happen. Firstly, supply chains need to be more reliable. Secondly, supply chains need to be more integrated or at least less disintegrated. <laughs> and thirdly, supply chains need to be more sustainable. Let me take each one of these in turn. In terms of reliability, um, Singapore does play a, pl play a part and Singapore knows its place. We are a small and connected global hub. We rely on the trust of businesses uh, and investors to keep us going. And when we keep going, supply chains also keep going. Prime example of this was during last year's uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, I think that during that time, foreign countries and investors found that they could trust Singapore to do the right thing. And they would know that their supplies that were flowing through Singapore would not be interdicted, would not be stopped and would continue to flow. Singapore did not impose any sort of export bans during COVID-19. And Singapore-based manufacturers continued supplying global customers, including essential products and medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, vaccines, diagnostic instruments, and N95 masks. During this time, we kept our sea and air links open. We facilitated the regional distribution of essential goods and vaccines. And even when passenger traffic collapsed during COVID-19, uh, our national carrier, Singapore Airlines, replaced that with freight traffic instead. And by doing so, we were able to divert many supplies to sea freight instead of air freight. In addition, uh, we signed supply chain connectivity agreements with many countries to reinforce our shared con commitment to the free flow of goods. And that in some way indicated that for reliability of supply chains, you need a little bit of determination. But that ha was what happened during COVID. Um, during normal circumstances, um, supply chains also need reliability that is based on data. Uh, we know that amid a lot of geopolitical tensions and supply disruptions, companies are looking for a neutral location and a safe environment as they reorganize their supply chains. Singapore has been planning ahead to ensure that we have a lot of these key enablers to position us as an important node uh, for global flows of goods, services and finance. And these include human capital and infrastructure, trade policies and technologies. For example, um, one of the roles that our port, the Port of Singapore has, is to be the go-to port for catch-up. We're called the catch-up port. So even with the shipping disruptions caused by Suez Canal blockages, and I think there was a port closure in China, uh, PSA would be the place where shipping lines come to catch up on lost time and connections. And the only way to do that is by working closely with various stakeholders and not just to think about port operations, but the entire part of the value chain and leverage technology and data about trade to look end to end in order to be able to perform that role. So that's what I have to say about reliability. Secondly, supply chains, as I've mentioned, need to be integrated. Singapore will continue championing global integration and strengthen our position as a node in the global supply chain. We do not wish to see a world divided into separate ecosystems. We know that there is a desire by many countries to onshore their supply chains, especially for essential goods. And I think some of my colleagues uh, who've spoken early have intimated at the deeper forces driving these developments, including concerns about technology leakage and national security. But countries pay a price if they swing to the other extreme. And we think autarky is not the solution given the complexity of supply chains. No single country can be entirely self-sufficient. It would be not only economically less efficient, but also strategically suboptimal. Because frankly, countries would then no longer have a shared interest in each other's economic success. We think that it is far better to diversify sources with trusted partners to reduce concentration risks and to work with one another to keep supply chains and trade flowing. Let me give you an example from semiconductors, which is a hot topic of tonight. The interlocking and complex global value chain has made it impossible for any country or region to achieve complete self-sufficiency in semiconductors, uh, not even China and the US. It is not uncommon that one semiconductor chip is designed in the US based on IP from the UK and then manufactured in Taiwan using chemicals from Japan 
equipment from the Netherlands and assembled in China. According to BCG, chips going through the full fabulous foundry and packaging cycle may cross international borders as many as 70 times. A hypothetical alternative with parallel, fully self-sufficient local supply chains in each region would require at least one trillion US dollars in incremental upfront investment and would result in a 35 to 65% overall increase in semiconductor prices. And this would mean ultimately higher costs of electronic device, devices for end users. We will therefore continue to work with international partners to promote that kind of global integration and support it with free trade agreements and digital economy agreements. My final point is that supply chains need to be a little bit more sustainable than they are today. And that speaks to a topic that I think is being discussed at COP26 this week, um, and uh, one that is on uh, many people's minds, uh, that is climate change and supply chains. I think there's a lot more to be done in terms of growing capabilities across the world in the greening of supply chains. And where that must start is by deepening R&D capabilities in maritime decarbonization. A lot of work is being done here on the research and trial of alternative fuels, such as green hydrogen, and also in the electrification of vessels uh, in the sea. And so I conclude, if we had a little bit more reliable, more sustainable, more integrated supply chains, I think this would be uh, something that uh, the world would look forward to. Thank you very much, Jacqueline, uh, for wonderfully consistent uh, view on how the world works and how we can get along in this world. The three keywords, reliability, integratedness, sustainability, that comes over and over again in the discussion. Uh, and you use semiconductors as well. It seems to be an abiding theme in all of our panelists' presentations. So it gives me great pleasure now to turn to Mr. Tsai Minkai, Chairman at MediaTek one of the world's largest semiconductor companies. Mr. Tsai, your products power billions of smart devices on our planet. You sit at the helm of the intersection point of the global economy's most critical supply chains, confirmed by how all our independent discussion keeps coming back to this. How do you see the challenges and opportunities here? Over to you, please. Okay, thank you, Danny. Well, since so many has been some of the peer speakers touch base about semiconductor. So I would like over some of my observation and comment on the semiconductor supply chain, more specifically, also in the broader context of supply chain and war conflict. Well, the COVID-19 is not the only cause of IC shortage in the auto or other industry. Actually, the reason for IC shortage pandemic is one reason, but actually the most uh, important reason is we are undergoing the digital transformation even without COVID. And COVID actually accelerates this uh, digital transformation, especially now we are in 4G to 5G transition and IoT everywhere and also the machine learning, AI development of the last 10 years caused everything to be more intelligent. So this is the most important digital transformation. And another reason is also the underinvestment of the so-called mature technology in the semiconductor technology you node. For most of the chip used in the automotive or some industry or not, not that advanced uh, import device, actually still use a lot of mature technology. This much chip are made by fully depreciated equipment However, the return of making new investment in the mature technology is low compared to investment in the cutting edge advanced technology. Because uh, the return is low, so foundries have less incentive to make such an investment. 
so the the reason the current capacity cannot supply to all the big demand in this uh, digital transformation. So the demand of this mature technology apply not just the auto industry, even in the smartphone chip. Besides the advanced uh, uh, SOC, the high performance process chip with communication technology, there are a lot of other chips still use the, the mature technology. So as the new equipment, new investment into mature technology actually will become more expensive. So because of, of that, the farmers will need to be compensated for their investment. So for a new investment, even just to catch up mature technology, actually we the customer all has to be prepared for this uh, higher cost. But uh, as uh, also someone mentioned about uh, this uh, kind of shortage in semiconductor property cannot be become uh, this is shop by end of next year. But anyway, it will be a transitory. So maybe by the time end of next year or year 2023, as the new capacity coming up gradually, the balance will become a new balance. Besides the supply chain and the new investment for the capacity, I would also like to offer some macro view from the technical doctor technology advancement. One only I, the most uh, important three force actually te technically slowing down of most low and secondly economically trade off between efficiency and supply chain security and the third force is that cost increase and inflation will be a new normal. The first force is uh, about technology. The most role of the semiconductor industry actually is slowing down. In the past, it generally took around uh, two years to advance to the next generation technology. But now beyond five nanometer, we have seen the process in slowing down. Technology development at the leading edge now takes longer time three years or more. So because of that, the rate of return actually is diminished. So the low of diminished return will translate into higher cost. So to meet the future market demand, semiconductor company will spend more in capex to build their design and capabilities. So for the end product, Consumers, in the past, we have enjoyed lower price and higher performance over the last few decades. But going forward, higher performance will come with higher cost. The second macro trend is the economic impact of pursuing supply chain security. The supply chain now is fully scattered around the world. So regional specialization in different phases of developing, producing, and using semiconductor. So as every region want to reassure their manufacturing of this uh, capacity, so this actually makes the trade-off between supply chain security and efficiency. So for a bit from business perspective, there will be a trade-off to enforce top-down restructuring of the supply chain will increase the cost for all suppliers in the ecosystem. And the higher cost will be reflected in the price of the final product to consumer. 
So consumer and investor, therefore, we have to adjust the new map condition for about by the decision and policy to secure the supply chain. The economy will reach a new state of balance under this new environment. So a new resilient supply chain can be reviewed after COVID-19, but the cost increase will be here to stay. So to meet the future demand, company in all region uh, accelerated their investment plan. So pressure will begin to build up for inflation. So we have to bear in mind that it is not practical to try to unwind a 50 years global system and build a complete supply chain within each single region. So to pursue a complete decouple, the regional economy is technically and economically almost impossible. So this is the uh, end of my observation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tai. Thank you very much from, from, uh, for, for these years from where you sit. I've got a lot of questions and not a great deal of time. So I want to just get a, first a question warming up everybody here, where you know, you've talked about, you know, Michael has mentioned geopolitics, Didi has mentioned the political economy, and Chad has talked about collaboration across different geographies. Uh, Jacqueline has told us about how you know, there are certain key principles to continue to keep in mind as we listen to Mr. Tsai's views on how semiconductor was evolving. I, I try and put all this together, and I think about the title of our session. The title of our session, Supply Chains in a World of Conflict and COVID-19. And that world of conflict and COVID-19, one of these, COVID-19, is an exogenous shock to the system. Conflict, however, emerged endogenously from the geopolitics and the political economy and the political narrative that nations tell themselves about what globalization has to do. So just to get a quick round going, what in what you have recommended or what you have observed alleviates the problem of conflict in the world? Don't think of conflict as a shock to the world that we then have to respond to. What in what you've recommended ameliorates the problem of conflict? Maybe Chad, I can begin with you because you've thought but how we build modalities of collaboration across different geographies. Let me begin with you. Over to you, please. So, um, and I think about this a lot. I think this is the key question. Now, I'm not, let me first start off by saying I'm not optimistic because, you know, two of the big um, problems that we're facing out there today are global in nature. And so I'm thinking climate and I'm thinking the pandemic. And we've yet to see sufficient concrete willingness um, by political leaders in, say, the United States and China, recognizing these are global challenges, global um, public goods that can only be addressed between the two collaboratively. So I'm not optimistic that we'll get there, even though I recognize sincerely the need to, to do so. More proactively. So in my example, what I did is I walked through... Um, three examples where we really do probably need increasing supply chain diversification that I'm not sure markets are going to deliver on, right? Because markets largely uh, ended up where we were on PPE, semiconductors, where arguably there's too much concentration for the high-end stuff, at least in places like Taiwan uh, and, and, and South Korea, and vaccines. Now, the challenge though is, um, or where the opportunities might lie for collaboration is everybody recognizing there's too much diversification and trade-offs associated, you know, recognizing there's trade-offs associated with there. So in the old days of trade agreements, we would say, I'll cut my tariff on steel if you cut your tariff on wheat, right? Here, we need to collaborate on kind of supply chains uh, and where we need more diversification, we need moving some stuff out of Asia, maybe it's PPE, maybe it's semiconductors. We need to move some stuff out of the United States and Europe, 
vaccine manufacturing, where that's just too concentration. In any case, it's not a one-way street. There's, I think, opportunities for collaboration and negotiation over these types of things if policymakers see the benefit in diversification and start to think creatively. Thank you very much, Chair. Didi, can I ask you to jump in quickly? Because you used ASEAN as an example where perhaps some of these uh, uh, external geopolitics has a different flavor. Can I get you to expand a little bit your reason for optimism? And then afterwards, I'm going to ask Jacqueline and Michael to reflect a little bit on Singapore's narrative in this area. Thanks, Danny. I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic on this, but I'm not really sure because the geopolitical situation uh, is uh, rather difficult nowadays. Yeah, you asked me about, about ASEAN. Uh, I think ASEAN's position, at least, you know, of course, leaders doesn't want to state it clearly, but we don't want to choose if there is a tension between or conflict between China and the US will be very difficult for us to choose, right? So that is why the idea of this ASEAN centrality become very important because it will be very difficult for us, country like in the ASEAN and uh, Southeast Asian economies to deal with China bilaterally. Yeah, and this is, this is, this is the thing that uh, is very difficult for us. But I have to say that even in the ASEAN, within the ASEAN, we are not really as united as what we had before. Look at what happened in the ASEAN leaders in 2012. Look at Cambodia, look at Laos, you know. So you mentioned about how to avoid conflict. I think this conflict is inherent, yeah. So, but we need to continue, as Jacqueline said, we need to continue to uh, maintain this uh, global integration, the supply chains. So the issue is within that constraint, how can we work with that? My, my, my solution for that is, Chad mentioned about this diversification. The other thing is try to find a common platform in which the ASEAN countries can work together. And one of the example is on the health issue, because I do believe that everyone would agree to work together on the health issue. This, is, this will incentivize political leaders to work together because there will be a sort of like strong pressure from the people to ensure that the government will be able to uh, handle the health issue. Thank you, Didi. Thank you very much for your answer. Now, Jacqueline, Michael, I want to bring you into the conversation now. When, when we talk about a world of conflict, uh, in my discussion with Chad and Didi, it, it's not unreasonable to think about conflict as being geopolitical conflict. There's been a hugely disruptive force in the world of globalization and global supply chains. But for globalization, conflict also enters domestic politics. In Singapore and in many other nations in the, around this region, actually everywhere in the world, we've had a long tortured discussion about our adherence to the rules of globalization. Even Singapore that trades 300% of its GDP for whom, you know, uh, you know supply chains and, and, and centrality as a global trading hub, globalization are absolutely critical to prosperity. There's a long tortured discussion about how open the economy should be. And this shows up in a lot of the questions that I'm getting in on, on chat and in the Google Docs uh, document. Uh, people are worrying, well, you know, if India withdraws from this agreement or that agreement, how do we get, how do we build structures that reassure nations that are insecure on globalization? Questions are longstanding, going back decades, but seeing reincarnation every day, even in places like Singapore. So Jacqueline, how do we make supply chains more integrated if one's own national citizenry are circumspect and suspicious on globalization and global supply chains? Thank you very much, uh, Danny. I don't think that in Singapore we're finding that we have a population that is uh, believing that Singapore we can make everything that we need and grow everything that we need in Singapore, <laughs> we're a postage stamp size of a nation. So I think there is a general consensus and this has been borne out by many surveys that uh, Singaporeans still believe in globalization and openness and so on, particularly in the flow of goods and services. I think where a lot of uh, more tension starts to arise uh, in many countries, and this was alluded to by uh, one of the other speakers, was about labor supply. 
And where globalization becomes a little bit more of a contentious issue is whether or not um, domestic populations in many countries feel uh, that they are getting a fair deal, uh, whether or not they feel that, you know, the supply, uh, you know, the, the global flow of labor has benefited them uh, directly or not. And this is, you can see this uh, as a driving force behind a number of uh, moves made, uh, including in Western countries like the UK with Brexit uh, or in the US, uh, but definitely also in Singapore, where there has been a certain amount of debate on the quality of um, uh, immigrants and uh, uh, workers from overseas that come to Singapore and what that means in terms of dependence or job competition. So this is a matter for assurance and I, that, that complementarity and that uh, belief that benefits do accrue to um, local populations is going to be quite critical if labor supply chains remain open. But in general, I think, unless countries do believe that they can make everything themselves, it's, it's not gonna be something of much uh, doubt. Separately, I would like to say in response to uh, uh, um, uh, my Indonesian colleague that uh, really long-term prospects for FDI in Southeast Asia are really quite bright. And um, I think that rebound in global, um, uh, investment into Southeast Asia as a whole region, uh, largely because of the reorganization of supply chains and the need to have a sort of cost-effective plus one location is something that is not going to be a bad thing for the region as a whole if we can position ourselves as a good platform for production. Okay, thank you, Jacqueline. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on this issue of what we do with a domestic population that I is think it, skittish? It doesn't have to be against globalization, but it's simply skittish about different aspects to it. Michael, you wanted to come in. Well, the, the only thing I was going to add to, to uh, I think those points have been very, very well made is, I mean, I think it's always been really difficult to build a case for globalization and amongst most sort of electorates. I mean, you know, typically, the benefits are much harder to see than the costs. You know, you, you open up or you allow free trade, someone's going to lose their job. The benefits in terms of enhanced productivity uh, and so on tend to be dispersed much more broadly. Often the goods that become cheaper are things you don't buy as often, uh, so you may not fully appreciate it. So I think that's always been really hard, but I think the positive that could change in the future, at least in many economies, is that we are now starting to see a bit of a redistribution um, of the economic pie away from capital towards labor and particularly towards lower end uh, or lower wage uh, workers. And that may help sort of reduce some of the popularist tendencies that we've seen, which tend to end up, rightly or wrongly, you know, people attribute it to globalization or to, um, uh, to, to people coming in and, and sort of taking their jobs and so on as they would see it. So if the, uh, you know, if, if you're seeing wage growth and tightness in the labor market, like I was referring to earlier, that could actually help reduce some of those pressures um, over time. Now, of course, along with that, we might be getting a slightly lower productivity growth and so uh, less growth in the overall pie uh, over time as a result, but maybe that's a price worth paying for maintaining a, a more stable economy and society. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to turn to a, a different set of issues that have been coming in on the, the set of questions. I'm going to try and organize them under the, the issue of risk and de-risking. Part of how we're trying to make the global economy more resilient, more robust in light of the shocks of the last few decades is so, you know, some of us are saying, oh, we need to diversify supply chains. We need to move away from there being a single supplier of anything. But of course, that's easier to say than to actually do. Uh, moving to an alternate supplier might mean losing efficiency, losing reliability. Moving to a clutch of alternative suppliers does not necessarily de-risk because the whole group of them might be strongly positively correlated. So as a closing, as we finish out this session, as all of you have been thinking about supply chains and their rewiring or making the world better, what's the one thing you want to see in the new global supply chains that would help us mitigate the risk profiles that humanity faces? Uh, perhaps I can begin with Mr. Tsai and then work my way back to the beginning. 
Oh, okay. The one thing you know, to, that you would like to see to make a more say, resilient supply chain to diversify the supply chain. As I said, this is no one single region can do that. So if let's say, I would say that totally decouple is uh, not possible. But since every country is actually start to make so many investments. So maybe we now say, let's say move back from fully globally, fully coupled system, ecosystem to a little some sub decoupled kind of stable state. But for that, as I said, you know, from we in the industry, in the business, from the whole supply chain, manufacturer, vendor, customer, and even the investor, we all have to prepare. If the more expensive ecosystem is acceptable in the future, maybe we have to live in that future. <laughs> so, but as I said earlier, we get, our, we get used to roller coaster better for homes over the last several decades. Then we have to change our mindset to, be, to prepare for a more expensive war in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Tai. Jacqueline, the one thing that we need to do to global supply chains. Yeah, responsiveness to price, <laughs> responsiveness to price signals. I think okay. that would be one of the most important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Michael, Michael Buchanan. Uh, I, I agree with those, so let me not just sort of repeat them, but, but add in, uh, I think we do want to think about climate in a much broader way and how that is going to impact all of the supply chain issues. I mean, obviously, you know, heat stress and floods are going to impact, you know, agri, textiles, apparel, you know, food and beverage, all that sort of thing. But, you know, climate events can also have an impact when you have really local or sort of strongly um, a sort of localized production of technology. You know, if you if you get uh, much greater precipitation in areas and, and that causes problems for, for production, that's that's one thing. But a broader point would be if the whole world moves towards focusing more on climate change and imposes carbon taxes, then we're going to need to have some way of leveling the playing field. That could lead to carbon border taxes being applied. I mean, Europe obviously is, is in the forefront of thinking about that. That's fantastic in theory uh, and hopefully in practice, but one concern would be it leads to um, protectionist measures being put on, pretending to be in line with those uh, carbon border taxes. And then that leads to a whole range of different issues that would lead to companies thinking about where to site production. I mean, if you're worried about those things being imposed, maybe you need to have you know, yet more reasons to diversify your, your, your footprint. So that's, that's something that I think is super important and we need to uh, come to agreement on how that's going to work, what the rules will be for carbon border taxes to avoid that going off in the wrong direction. Thank you very much. One of the largest uh, crises that the world faces today and how we manage that. Thank you very much. Chad, how we do uh, risk? So, Danny, I think you'll you'll appreciate this one in particular as a as an empirical economist. Um, we need data. Policymakers need information. These supply chain bottlenecks. I mean, honestly, these these supply chains are so complex um, that oftentimes the the firms that are involved in them don't even know, and let alone expecting policymakers to be able to help and to craft policies. Um, that, that are going to be useful and, and responsive. We've seen some extraordinary policy initiatives uh, take place throughout the pandemic in a, in a wide variety of areas. The ones that I've studied in the United States, the use of the Defense Production Act um, in unprecedented areas like vaccines has given the, the federal government um, visibility into and a role in, in some of these supply chains that we've never seen before. Um, I'm not saying that that needs to become the new normal, but I do think we need... Uh, more information. We need better layers of trust between policymakers and business. Um, and I'm worried that in many respects, we're heading in the wrong direction there because to get good policy, we, we actually need information. <laughs> and a lot of it yeah. is just really hard to acquire. Interesting. I mean, as you know, the, the second session of this first uh, Next Step conference is on how big data 
is managed in today's global economy. But you know, we'll have to see how that, how that, how the two different directions that big data narratives are going uh, manage this. Didi, I've got you to get the last word in. You've got 90 seconds to tell us what the one thing you want to see change in global supply chains that would de-risk our world. I believe in the market force because I do believe you mentioned about this transitional risk, but I do believe that the cost of being an author key will outweigh of this transitional risk. So that is why let me come with a more optimistic view, even though the cost is there, but I believe that every country will need to maintain the global supply chain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much panel and thank you very much audience. This is a panel that was supposed to go until 8.45 exactly. But as you know, we've got a very, very important session in addition to this very important session, but another very important session uh, coming up and I've got to make the, the deadline on that exactly. So I want to thank my panelists for such a wonderful, lively, animated, and I hope, uh, and discussion, and I hope you didn't mind that I've tried to provoke you a little bit more than my instincts normally would allow me, but it made for a very wonderful discussion, I thought. I wanted to, to thank the audience uh, you know, the studio audience out there for such a wonderful set of questions and challenges that they brought in. There was no way I could get to every single one of them, but I tried to summarize into and slip that into our conversation. Please stay tuned for the next session that will be a keynote speech by U.S. Commerce Secretary, Dr. Gina Raimondo, and then stay after that for a conversation between her and Senior Minister Taman to be moderated by Adam. Uh, thank you audience and thank you panel for such a wonderful, wonderful time we've been able to have together. Thank you very much. Back to the controllers, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm grateful to Danny for his masterful moderation and to our global set of panelists for taking us through the multiple dimensions of the issue, geographic sector being academic or being a practitioner as MK was, or the minister. Um, it's really the goal of the Next Step Conference to keep in mind these big picture important issues, but to keep the practitioner's perspective as well. In that spirit, we are about to be joined by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, the Honorable Gina Raimondo. Um, I am awaiting confirmation from her office that she is online. Um, I appreciate the previous session ending on time so that we can move forward as soon as the Secretary is with us. Just two reminders to people, and please don't go away because the discussion between Secretary Raimondo and Senior Minister Shankunaratnam will be the first conversation of substance that the Secretary is having in public on the issue of supply chains, and in particular, since the Saturday announcement of the step back in tariffs between the US and EU, which she was the appointed US cabinet official to announce it. Uh, I've just been told she is not quite ready, so we will hold on a moment. So let me make two other announcements. First, to remind everyone, this is the launch of the Next Step Conference series, a joint effort between the Peterson Institute for International Economics and the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. We are proud to be guided by an international advisory board chaired by the senior minister from Singapore, Tharman Changunaratnam. This is, however, an independent conference intentionally. Um, I'm obviously botching people's names today and I apologize. Um, I am delighted that we had the panel we just did. We are committed to bringing together not just an Asian perspective and not just a policy perspective, but a practical perspective from multiple angles. 
The next step conference will continue tomorrow, Singapore time, with a panel on big data and how that relates to the efficacy of public policy. We will have representation at a senior level from Google, from academics at the Peterson Institute, and from a national security perspective from the Asia Society. And again, a relatively diverse set of speakers We hope to continue to move in that direction. Following day in morning Washington time, evening uh, Singapore time, we will have a joint event with the Monetary Authority of Singapore with whom we're proud to partner, a closing to our event and the opening dinner for the Golden Jubilee of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Martin Wolf, Chief Economics Commentator of the Financial Times and one of the leading voices in the world for how to think about the political economy of globalization, will be giving a dinner talk introduced by Ravi Menon, the head of the Monetary Authority, and then moderated by Danny Kwa. Finally, I would just remind everyone that we are launching the Next Step Conference series with this event, and we're proud and delighted to have Secretary Ronando and Tharman with us, as well as our distinguished panelists. We are going to be launching the in-person with public virtual events, but the in-person version of the Next Step Conference in May 2022 in Singapore, and we will look forward to seeing you annually for that thenceforth. Now, if I may, I'd like to try to introduce Secretary Gina Raimondo. Secretary Raimondo is the U.S. Secretary of Commerce and formerly was the 75th governor of the U.S. state of Rhode Island and was its first woman governor. She previously served as general treasurer of Rhode Island, a statewide elected position. Interestingly and importantly for her worldview, she was founding employee and senior vice president of Village Ventures and founder of Point Judith Capital, Rhode Island's only venture capital firm. In other words, the secretary brings multiple perspectives from business and investment, from elected official governance, as well as as a working person, as well as coming from Rhode Island, next door to where I grew up, um, which is a state that doesn't always get represented in global affairs, even though like all US states and all countries, it is part of the global economy. So for these and many other reasons, we're delighted to have with us a member of President Biden's cabinet, the Secretary of Commerce, the Honorable Gina Raimondo. And before turning over to her, let me congratulate you, Secretary Raimondo, on the announcement of the step back in the tariff conflict over steel and aluminum with the European Union. That obviously feeds into our important discussion today, where you're joining us to speak about supply chain issues and global trade. Thank you, Secretary Raimondo. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate that. And I appreciate that kind and warm introduction. Uh, it's wonderful for me to be here with you and to be joined by Minister Tharman. And thank you so much for joining us. And of course, all the distinguished guests. It's, you have a terrific panel and a terrific day lined up. Um, so as you all know, recently at the East Asia Summit, President Biden reaffirmed our commitment to the Indo-Pacific region. And he outlined his vision for the region one that's open, connected, prosperous, resilient, and importantly, secure. He announced the development of an Indo-Pacific economic framework that will define our shared objectives um, around standards for the digital economy and technology, supply chain resiliency, topic on the top of everyone's mind, decarbonization, infrastructure, and other areas of shared interest. Of course, I applaud the president for this and the Commerce Department will be uh, kind of central to developing that economic framework and working with our partners in the region uh, to, to develop and execute on that. Um, we're already moving forward with a new U.S.-Singapore partnership for growth and innovation that will integrate our economies even further. And the US and Singapore have committed to a high level dialogue on supply chains. Uh, again, something I, 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 am, I am 
focused on this day in and day out. And so it's exciting to work with our partners in Singapore to, to try to find some solutions to our supply chain challenges and develop long-term resiliency. Um, I've been the co-chair of the President's Supply Chain Disruptions Task Force, and of course, hope to bring all of that work to my work here in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, in the US, we're taking a dual approach of investing in domestic manufacturing, as well as pursuing what we're calling friend shoring, uh, so that like-minded partners like all of you are fully integrated into our supply chains. And that means looking for areas of greater collaboration, increased transparency, agreement on supply chain resiliency principles, sharing best practices, identifying diverse sources of supply, and coordinating investments in alternative supply chains. Um, and we hope to expand our partnerships across Asia to strengthen the commercial ties between our companies, which will improve business conditions and help us to combat climate change in, in America and in the region. Um, I will say I am uh, really looking forward to the engagement in the region and working with like-minded partners to get the job done. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. And again, just thank you so much for having me this morning. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, we're going to have an on-the-record discussion, which the Secretary and the Senior Minister have graciously agreed to give and to have two leaders of the global economy come together is a great opportunity for the next conference. Just let me say again that Tharman is the senior minister in Singapore, having served for several years as deputy prime minister and finance minister. He is concurrently chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore and coordinating minister for social policies. So like Secretary Raimondo, uh, the government of Singapore and the Biden administration are very concerned about the linkages of trade, social outcomes, and political stability. Um, Tharman also co-chairs the G20 High-Level Independent Panel on Financing Pandemic Security and chairs the Group of 30, which is a leading independent global council of economic and financial leaders. Um, let me start um, just by going just quickly to Tharman for a response to uh, the list of initiatives that Secretary Raimondo started with. Um, how does Singapore see the U.S. moving forward in the region now, and how do you see this concept of friend shoring? I think I think that's a new coinage. So, uh, how does that strike you? And then we'll turn back to the secretary. Uh, thanks, Adam, and I'm very happy to be here with Secretary Raimondo. Um, I would say the uh, underlying principle. Uh, uh, the underlying principle is that of diversification. And diversification comes out of uh, all the uncertainties that we face uh, globally. Um, COVID-19 has um, led to a step change in the way in which global corporations, as well as, you know, I'd say even medium-sized corporations, are thinking about supply chains. Uh, not just their own manufacturing supply chains, but also logistics uh, networks. And I don't think we're going back to where we were uh, two years ago. But it's not about a retreat from globalization as much as it is about diversifying supply chains and better risk management. Better risk management, including a whole set of practices, including inventories, uh, but also that ability to to flex production from one side to another at short notice. And that's now becoming part and parcel of advanced management uh, for companies all over the world. Um, it offers, I think, a place in the world for ASEAN. It offers a place in the world for uh, most developing regions. Uh, and I think what we really want to do is to try and avoid this being a either or. In other words, either you're part of a US network or you know, US catalyzed network of supply chains, or you're part of a uh, China or other network of supply chains. I think the world will be much worse off uh, if that were the case. Uh, it'll be worse off for each of the major economies. It'll be worse off for the developing world. 
we've got to try and mitigate as much as we can uh, the risk of bifurcation of supply chains, of technology standards, um, and even of uh, norms. So that's our challenge. Uh, and we've got to all play our part in trying to ensure as much as possible that we are in an open and connected world, not just for goods and services, but increasingly uh, for data, for data and digital services. That's the next major project um, for the WTO and for all of us. That's the next major project. Um, and I believe it is possible. I believe it is possible. Uh, just as it was never to the advantage of individual countries or the world to have um, frictionful uh, or um, choked up uh, supply chains and goods and traditional services, uh, it's not going to be in anyone's interest to uh, have uh, anything other than a free flow of data and digital services uh, around the world. Um, people sometimes say that data is like oil. Uh, it is and it isn't, uh, because unlike oil, unlike goods in general, the data is what the economists call um, a non-rival good. It's non-rivalrous. In other words, your consuming data doesn't make it less possible for someone else to consume data. And it's in the very nature of data that the more there is and the more extensively it is used everywhere in the world, the more innovation you're going to get, the more productivity growth you're going to get, the more you improve well-being everywhere. So it's a bit like the global commons. Unlike traditional uh, trade in goods and services where competition is good and it spurs efficiency and so on and so forth. Here it's not just about competition. It is a non-rival good. It's in everyone's interest that we have that free flow of data. And it means we do need to have principles governing the cross-border flow of data. And we need principles governing the flow of everything else, capital goods, services, everything else, which now embed more data than ever before. And that's the new multilateral framework that we need uh, for data. It's a major project. Several countries have started off on a bilateral and a plurilateral basis. Uh, the US and Singapore see eye to eye on it. Several of our partners do. Japan, Canada, New Zealand, uh, the Europeans increasingly, and I believe China will as well, because it's in China's interests. So that's an opportunity. And I'll just stop, stop there, uh, Adam. Thank you, Tharman. Um, turning back to the Secretary, you may want to respond to some of that, but putting in the broader context, I mean, we are all very much aware, given recent economic developments and the COVID crisis, of the importance now of global supply chains. There seems to be a general assessment, which I agree with, that supply chains may have gotten too tenuous, not sufficiently diversified and resilient. How do you see the trends for right-sizing supply chains? What role do you see governments like the Commerce Department in the US playing in this process? Yes, thank you. So first, I wanna take a second to respond to what Tharman was saying, um, much of which I agree with. Uh, all of which I agree with. But, um, you know, the interesting thing about data, unlike oil, is it's also unlimited. It's an infinite supply. Uh, and that's, I think, a key difference. The other thing is, although, of course, I agree with you that we don't want to set up, a, as you say, bifurcation, we do need trusted networks, you know, under, underpinning data, uh, our networks, and uh, they have to be trusted. You know, they have to be trusted networks and, and the standards which govern networks, the privacy protections, the cyber protocols. Um, we are looking forward to engaging in the region with Singapore and, and other like-minded um, you know, democracies around the world to write the rules of the road as it relates to data and digitization uh, consistent with our 
belief in privacy, our democratic values, so that we can have trusted networks, which I believe, which we believe will only enhance our ability to have, you know, a global economy that you describe, um, because trust will underpin our ability to collaborate. Um, to your question, Adam, about uh, supply chains, you know, I think I can safely say that we used, we didn't pay much attention to supply chains. You know, the other day on Saturday, yesterday, my husband and I were at the farmer's market and we were buying some um, uh, uh, pasta, you know, lo local homemade pasta and, you know, from a small, small stand at a farm stand. And the fellow was talking to me about supply chains and how the supply chain disruption was upsetting his very small business. And so we went from a place of not paying attention to a place of being obsessed with it. And I hope we've learned that lesson, which is to say we cannot take our eye off the ball of developing resilient, diverse supply chains because we're, we're living through a painful period now where these disruptions in our supply chains are affecting um, even the smallest businesses, of course, up to the biggest businesses. So, you know, to your question of the role of government, government obviously doesn't run supply chains and we don't want to be in the business of running supply chains. Like very clearly do not want to be in that business. This is a private sector endeavor, massively complicated, global in nature. Uh, what we do need to do, though, is support our businesses. We want to, you know, for a long time, there's been this obsession with just-in-time. And I think we're learning that there are limitations to the just-in-time approach. It doesn't take into account, you know, resiliency, as Tharman was saying, you know, just-in-case, right? We have to think about just-in-case, just-in-case we, we have a COVID-like event, climate events. So, our role in government, I think, is to encourage the private sector to add more resiliency to supply chains, more suppliers, more transparency. Um, you know, the president has encouraged ports to move to be 24-7. That is obviously vital uh, at the moment and probably should be maintained as such going forward. I have been, the Commerce Department, you asked about us, we've been convening CEOs of semiconductor chip companies constantly, uh, collecting data from them, pushing for more transparency. You know, there's, when there's a lack of transparency in a supply chain, lack of trust develops. Suppliers worry, um, are consumers hoarding or stockpiling? consumers wonder, where are all the chips going? Am I getting my fair share? So one thing that we are trying to do in the government at the Commerce Department is increase transparency, which ought to increase trust. And then earlier I mentioned this concept of friend shoring. Uh, it used to be near shoring, although of course our Indo-Pacific allies are not really near, but they are certainly friends. And in today's globalized economy, uh, when a factory shuts down in, you know, Malaysia due to a COVID outbreak, it can have an outsized effect in our own backyard. So developing resiliency um, is critical, you know, and when you, uh, in order to develop that resiliency, we have to coordinate our investments in supply chains across the globe. And in that respect, you know, I will be, the Commerce Department will be in the middle of that, really encouraging this cross-border investment and collaboration, which will accrue to the benefit of, of really, you know, the whole world, not just America. Thank you. Um, we have a lot to get through, uh, and we're hearing new terms coined as we go. So this is history making, this is good. Um, Garmin, you've been very focused recently for good reason on the global inequalities in vaccine production and distribution, as well as thinking about the next pandemic. Could you say a bit more about the supply chain aspects of that? What you wanna see happen in that space with regards to vaccines and pandemic, both now and for future? That's a large new problem in public policy, Adam, that we haven't faced before. Um, put, uh, squarely, it is a challenge of having substantial overcapacity 
in vaccine manufacturing ahead of a pandemic of uncertain timing and uncertain nature. And we've learned that we need that overcapacity ahead of a pandemic uh, from the experience of the last two years. Because what we know from the last two years is that responding to a pandemic in ways that avoid prolonging a pandemic and avoid uh, the staggering inequalities that we've seen is all about speed and scale. Uh, what we saw uh, at remarkable speed was the development of vaccines, development, testing, and uh, approval of vaccines. But two years on, uh, the bulk of the world's population uh, hasn't been vaccinated. And that, by its very uh, nature, has allowed for continuous mutation of the virus and is prolonging the, the pandemic. So if you want to avoid that in future, we need to be able to move to respond much more swiftly and on a global scale once a pandemic strikes. And you can't do that unless you have at ready facilities, ever warm facilities, both manufacturing and delivery capacity and end to end supply system. Uh, if you don't have that, it's going to take two years once again and at enormous costs for countries individually and collectively. Now that's a new public policy challenge because the private sector does not have an incentive to invest in overcapacity ahead of a pandemic. Second, uh, the private sector will not know, uh, none of us knows exactly which pathogen is going to be the source of the pandemic and does not know which vaccine candidate is going to be successful is going to go through phase three trials successfully and get approved. We don't know in advance. So you need to have multiple vaccine candidates and you need to have facilities that are able to produce different candidates and you need them to be globally distributed as well. So they are less, they are a little more resilient to some of the um, short-term supply chain problems or even protectionist actions in a major crisis. So it does require because you can't rely on the private sector, it doesn't have enough commercial incentive to do it ahead of time and to have it spread across candidates of uncertain success uh, uh, probabilities. You need a public-private collaboration. Uh, the one thing that um, worked better in the US than elsewhere was precisely that system involving BARDA and several other public agencies uh, that, by the way, looked, um, you know, it's not, it's not the America that people uh, uh, think of very often, but it's actually a very active role for the state, coordinated with the private sector, and even with the U.S. Army involved, uh, that managed to actually get vaccine development and production out as quickly as possible. And what we need really is a global BADA, or if you like, a network of BADA-like entities. Europe has now started CARA. Uh, the, you've got the Af African Vaccine Alliance. You need a network that connects regional and large country capabilities into a coherent global system. Again, the market doesn't do this. We need a way of coordinating capacity ahead of time and fast response in an actual crisis. And it's not going to happen without a deep collaboration between the public and private sector internationally. And it can be achieved. It can be achieved. And that's exactly why we need the G20 task force um, coming in part out of the proposals of the high-level independent panel that I co-chaired with Larry Summers and, and Gozi uh, to address this forthrightly. It requires global coordination. It is complex in details, but not complex in principle. The principle is it's in every country and region's interest to collaborate in setting up this end-to-end -end supply ecosystem. It requires public sector money, but we should use that public sector money to incentivize and catalyze private investment. That's our challenge. We haven't faced this challenge before. I mean, perhaps we should, should have done it after Ebola. We didn't. 
each time a pandemic hits, the political appetite for fundamental reform fades once it's once we are past the worst, and particularly once we are past the worst in the most advanced nations. You must not allow that to happen again. We must not allow pandemic memory to disappear from the system. We don't want to remember the horrendous human costs, but we need pandemic memory built into the system so it never happens again. Thank you, Tharman. Um, Secretary Raimundo, well, of course, again, you're welcome to comment on the vaccines. I, I want to go back with our limited time to the announcement you made on behalf of the Biden administration, which has been filled in a bit about the step back in the tariff conflict between the US and EU. I'm using the term step back because it's not a full resolution. It's not a full withdrawal of tariffs, but it was a change. Um, first, just can you say a bit more about what damages to various groups, producers, consumers in the US retaliated against industries led to you and the administration taking the step? And second, in light of your remarks a few minutes ago about nearshoring isn't as good as friendshoring because our friends are not necessarily just who are adjacent. Um, there are a lot of allies, including Japan, Korea, that are not in the EU that were caught up in this tariff battle by the Trump administration. Can we hope that you'll be treating some of the other allies who are not in the direct EU deal similarly? Yeah. So first, let me say, in response to Tharman, um, I love pandemic memory. That it, This is, of course, easier said than done, because human nature being as it is, we react to crisis and then we think it's fine. Um, but I think that's our third. We have friend shoring, just in case, and now pandemic memory. I love that. And I think we ought to hold ourselves accountable um, to having that memory. So we take the steps now to develop the resiliency so that next time this happens, and it will happen, as you just said, we should have done a post Ebola, uh, we will be ready. So we can, we can uh, work on that together. Um, in any event, the announcement about the 232 tariffs was really quite significant. Um, the EU was planning to impose 50% tariffs on December 1st, automatically on December 1st, a 50% tariff on a, a range of important uh, American products, uh, bourbon, whiskey, rye, the entire distillery industry, I mean, which is, by the way, the greatest source of jobs in the state of Kentucky. So it, it would have decimated Kentucky's um, economy. No, I think we should all stipulate, you, you can't survive with a 50% tariff. I mean, it's a quite excessive tariff. Harley Davidson, which has thousands of employees in Wisconsin would have, I don't know, probably had to shut down that plant or certainly ratcheted back significantly. Uh, Levi's, jeans, I mean, really iconic American brands. So thankfully that will not happen. The tariffs uh, uh, will, will not be imposed. And that's really a huge win for those industries. Just as important, if not more important, it's a really important um, moment in our transatlantic relationship with the EU. President Biden came into office saying, pledging, that we were going to repair our uh, relationships with our allies, and this is proof. You know, this is this is putting that principle into action. We worked with the EU to resolve this trade irritant. The it will allow millions of tons of steel to come into America from the EU, duty free, tariff free, uh, which is obviously very important. Importantly, though, it requires that the steel and aluminum be um, produced in the EU. So, you know, the enemy here was never the EU. Our shared enemy was Chinese uh, dumping of their excess capacity into the world market, distorting the global steel market, uh, hurting the EU and the EU workers and America. So this is a very significant um, action whereby we are working with our allies 
to push back on uh, Chinese excess capacity, thereby protecting the industry and workers in the US and the EU in the steel industry. Um, obviously, in this moment, as we are struggling with supply chain disruption and price increases, this is also a tremendous um, you know, step forward in that regard. The, the industry, I mean, steel is in everything. <laughs> it's in your car, it's in your truck, it's in your dishwasher, your refrigerator, your dryer. So this, of course, will, will bring down prices for these, these companies, which will flow through to the consumer. Here in America, uh, steel prices have gone up almost fourfold in the past 12 months. So this is really a very significant. And to your question of our allies, we will, yes, get to work working with our allies, um, like-minded, as you say, Japan, and, and uh, the UK, you know, and, and really try to resolve the same, you know, same trade irritant with them as well. Thank you. I'm afraid I have to do one follow-up on that. If the enemy is Chinese overproduction, what's the irritant from the UK and Asian allies that you want to continue this? Oh, sorry, we haven't resolved the 232 tariffs with the UK. So in other words, the deal that we struck with the EU is with the EU. No, I, 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 sorry, I understand. I was just asking, since you said just a minute ago, the, the purpose ultimately is to deal with Chinese overcapacity and supply. Why are you not just lifting similarly for other allies the way you're lifting for the EU? Yeah, I think we will get there. We just, that's what I'm trying to say. We did this with the EU. Now we have to sit down with our other allies and come up with a negotiate, you know, negotiate. We have to do the work to sit down to negotiate to see if we can, can't also get rid of this irritant with those allies. Okay, thank you, Secretary. Um, Thurman, as one of those US allies, Singapore is obviously not a steel exporter, um, so you don't have, or aluminum exporter, you don't have this issue of uh, directly of the 232s, but you are aware obviously of the Biden approach and the previous Trump approach on these matters. Speaking not for other US Asian allies, but as a US Asian ally, how do you see the Biden administration's partial continuation of the, this approach? Well, I think Singapore's perspective is uh, uh, predictable. Uh, as you say, we are not a steel or aluminum, aluminum producer, but uh, steel and aluminum go into lots of other things. Uh, and the world economy uh, is going to be a weaker economy if we do not see a rollback of uh, all forms of uh, protection and discrimination. Um, and I think as we come out of COVID, and as we address a extremely challenging period ahead, uh, we should try as much as we can because there's some problems which are really difficult to solve and difficult to solve quickly. We should try as much as we can to uh, roll back on the problems that are easier to solve. Um, and it requires, of course, not just international negotiations and uh, some give and take on both sides, it requires also the appropriate domestic strategies, which Secretary Raimondo also touched on briefly in her opening remarks. Um, that's what I think every responsible government has to do. Find ways of freeing up internationally, but double down on the right domestic, social and economic strategies to preserve inclusiveness and ensure that you've got that broad base of good jobs that are being created not always the same jobs that existed before, but you're always catering to that broad base of the workforce uh, with good jobs. So, um, thank you, Tharman. Let me try to be a little bit provocative to both of you on this, because I know you care deeply about this link between social cohesion or social justice, I shouldn't say or, and social justice with international commerce. Um, the, Speaking as an economist, not a policymaker, the record of creating so-called good jobs is, is not very good in the sense of governments being able 
to will them into being. And in fact, there's a lot of record of trying to create good jobs and ending up creating negative feedback loops entitled groups, intra actual more rather than less conflict inside societies, regional differences being perpetuated. Again, it's very different for a small economy like Singapore geographically and a continent-wide economy like the US, but both are multi-ethnic um, democracies. And so there are a lot of commonalities as well. Um, we've been fortunate in the past at Peterson Institute to have Tharman speak about this. Um, Secretary Raimondo, maybe go to you first. Just what is your vision for how We've heard the phrase trade policy for the middle class uh, repeatedly from officials at your level in the Biden administration. What is your vision for how this should be integrated into both commerce and social justice? How, how do we think about this? Particularly since the world, let's remember, is not all about manufacturing jobs. No matter how many manufacturing jobs we're going to create, it's not going to be everybody or even close to a majority in any society. Sorry to go on so long, but I want to set it up for your broad think as part of the next step conference. So please, Secretary Raimondo of the department. Yes, no, you're exactly right. By the way, as you say, um, although we are going to work very hard to enhance manufacturing in America, you know, for example, on semiconductors, something I spend a lot of time on, we want to make more chips in America. That's clear. We will create thousands of jobs doing that. That's clear. Having said that, you know, manufacturing is becoming more automated. Uh, so you're exactly right. Even if we have, even if we have more manufacturing in America, it is more automated, and not everyone can have a manufacturing job. Uh, which and and to your point around social cohesion, look, I I believe our nation is at an inflection point. You know, so we have. Uh, unprecedented income inequality in our country. Inequality uh, based on geography, race, educational attainment. And it is, it's why the President Biden said, we're in a fight for the soul of America. So many of our problems as a country have been created and exacerbated by that economic inequality. And so we have to meet the demands of the moment if we're going to really address that inequality. Um, I will say, you know, that's why we are so focused on passing the president's uh, Build Back Better agenda, because it will enable, for example, broadband, high quality, affordable, high speed broadband for every single American. You know, you cannot have broadly shared prosperity if 35% of Americans who live in rural areas don't have access to broadband, you, you can't, you can't do it. 50% uh, of Americans who live on tribal lands don't have access to broadband. Um, workforce development, president's calling for big investments in apprenticeships. Well, when you think apprenticeship, maybe the image that comes into your mind is the building trades, plumbers, welders, and that's all good. I think digital apprenticeships. I think cybersecurity technicians. I think cyber tech apprenticeships in middle America for you know uh, black and brown kids in urban America who need access to these skills so they can get these jobs, so they can come into the workforce, stay in the workforce and make a decent income. So there's no, you know, I could go on all morning and I promise I won't, but like the point is there's, we need, as Tharman said, domestic investments, building our infrastructure, investing in technology, investing in basic R&D, basic research and development. Over the last 30 years, if you were to, to draw a graph, you're an economist, Adam, if you were to graph, you know, R&D investments, as a percent of American GDP, it would be a straight downward slope. We need to invest in R&D so that that turns into uh, you know, more manufacturing, get the great ideas coming out of colleges and universities and turn them into products we make in America, all over America, middle America as well, and then have you know, the, 
job training initiatives to make sure people get these jobs. So in any event, I think there's no one thing. I think it is the challenge of our time. And I, President Biden has a very bold initial program, set of programs to make those investments so that we can, you know, create those jobs and have the prosperity be more equally shared in America. But last thing I'll say, you know, like women, 2 million women are still out of the workforce now post COVID. They will stay out of the workforce unless childcare becomes more affordable. Why can every other industrialized nation in the world provide public pre-K and childcare and we can't? It, if we don't make those investments, we will not tap into women's economic potential and it will continue to erode this social cohesion that you talk about. So there's no one thing, but I think it is the most important thing that we'll work on as an administration. Thank you very much, Secretary Miando. I, I cannot resist on your last comment, just throwing my full weight, such as it is, behind it. Um, the success of Abenomics, Womenomics in Japan to turn around female labor force participation shows it can be done. Um, and that pre-K nursery school uh, per leave for flexible work policies for women and support for women getting equal pay, but necessary support for their role in the family, I think is critical. And I'm, of all the things you've mentioned, I am proud that the, that the Biden administration is taking that on. Um, Tharman, forgive me for editorializing, but as you know, I've, we, we at Pearson have been working on that issue for a long time. Um, so to wrap us up, uh, maybe you could say a few words also about how you see trade and inclusion coming together. Well, very much in the same spirit as uh, Secretary Raimondo. Uh, and, you know, reflecting on that earlier remark you made, Adam, about how, well, look, this hasn't worked very well uh, in the past, um, the state getting involved in industry. The two things that didn't work well uh, in the past were first, uh, the state trying to pick winners in private industry, individual firms, um, sometimes even individual uh, clusters or industries, hasn't had a great record. Um, second, uh, subsidized state enterprise. Uh, that hasn't worked well uh, anywhere in the world. Um, and we used to associate that as a problem to do with the socialist economies. Um, but it's, uh, it's a problem that's lived on uh, well beyond socialism in a whole range of other economies. And I should just add as a uh, uh, important aside for those of us who are economists that two weeks ago we saw the passing of uh, Janos uh, Kornai, um, uh, who was a, uh, perhaps more than anyone else, uh, the person who exposed the systematic or systemic uh, weaknesses of the socialist economies um, uh, and they, the fact that soft budget constraints uh, were not just accidental, not just political, they were systematic. Uh, but Kornai soft budget constraints uh, exist in a whole range of other economies, even after the falling of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and we should be well aware of that. So that's the old industrial policy weaknesses that we know of the old dirigism. Um, but what uh, Secretary Raimondo was talking about and what I believe we need to address now with the renewed energy is the development of collective capacity, not picking individual winners, not trying to have subsidized state enterprises uh, creating a new infant industry. It's really about developing collective capacity. And that means everything from a strong preschool sector to provide opportunities for social mobility, or at least not stunt social mobility early in life. It means a high quality public school sector. It means broadband, as Secretary Raimondo was emphasizing, broadband across uh, the full span of the population. Um, and it's not just a huge problem in the developing world, it's also a problem in uh, the most advanced countries. You have large parts of major cities um, in the advanced countries, including the United States, uh, where the majority of the population does not have broadband. Uh, it means on a global scale, girls' education, uh, which is a, a huge collective capacity issue, quite apart from being uh, imposing severe inequality 
gender inequality in those societies. It's a huge issue of collective capacity as well. Um, and I would like to highlight one issue which economists are familiar with, but doesn't translate enough into public policy. And that is that we do have to address what is now a very stubborn problem of low productivity growth across the advanced world and slowing productivity growth in the emerging world. If you take the mature economies, uh, the US is doing a little better than most in the last uh, few years, but if you take the mature economies as a whole, productivity growth was running at slightly above 2% in the years before the global financial crisis, the first part of the decade. Uh, it was running at about 1% after the global financial crisis for about a whole decade. And it's now still stuck there. In fact, even in 2020, um, which saw things come down and then go up, you're still running at about 1%. Uh, and what's important is that we have reduced diffusion, reduced spread of innovation and productivity improvements from the frontiers to the rest of the economy. Because that's always been the, the big game in productivity growth. It's really the spread of innovations and breakthroughs from a leader and a leading sector, all those at the frontier, to the rest of the economy. That, that's what uplifts the system as a whole, and that, that's what leads to wages rising across the board. And we've seen systematically reduced spread of innovation and productivity growth. The reasons are complex. Uh, they may have to do with increasing concentration in industry, which is, a, which is something that's been measured. But I think this challenge in public policy is also important. Thank you. What do we do? And what do we do to avoid concentration of not just power, but concentration of innovation amongst a few and enable its spread? Thank you, Tharman. Um, Sorry to end right there, although I think that is a critical issue, which, as you know, Peterson Institute's been working on the G7, the G20. And we're very glad to have you bring the long-term productivity and the diffusion of innovation to be part of this picture. I want to thank Secretary Gina Raimondo, Senior Minister Tharman for gracing us with their presence and their frank, practical combination of, of commitment and policy steps. Uh, the next step conference of Peterson Institute and LKY School could not have gotten off to a better start. I will just say that the second session of our inaugural conference will take place at 8 p.m. Eastern time today, uh, 8 a.m. Uh, Tuesday in Singapore on economic policy and policy making in a big data, big tech global economy, including Marcus Bronemeyer, Chong and Bai, Karan Bacha, Martin Trezempa, and Alina Noor. But for this morning, with thanks to all our panelists, and particularly Secretary Raimondo, and, and Tharman, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.